confirm the rumors. We are building the son of the Blackbird, a new plane, the SR-72. An aircraft designed to fly at over Mach 6. That exact same philosophy is coming back to the U.S. Air Force after 60 years. But what was so special about the legendary aircraft? 2,193 miles per hour. That's a record that has never been broken. And the plane that set it? It was built back in the 1960s, the SR-71 Blackbird. But what's amazing isn't just the plane. It's the simple, radical belief that created it. And here's the crazy part. That same belief is now powering its successor, a plane that's about to rewrite the rules of flight all over again. And when you see it in the air, it's a piece of artwork. So what was that radical belief? It's this simple. The SR-71 wasn't just about being fast. That wasn't the goal. It was the entire philosophy. Pure, uncatchable speed is the ultimate form of survival. But that wasn't born in a design meeting. It was forged in a crisis. See, to understand the Blackbird, you have to know the plane that came before it, the U-2. It was America's top spy plane flying at 70,000 feet, so high they thought it was invincible. They were wrong. On May 1, 1960, a U-2 was shot out of the sky over the Soviet Union. The pilot was captured, the secret was out. It wasn't just an embarrassment, it was a disaster. And it proved a terrifying point. Flying high wasn't enough. You had to be untouchable. They needed a plane that was so fast that by the time the enemy even saw it, it was already gone. You know, Mach 3, boom. The turn radius is something like 100 miles and they have all these critical fuel problems and, and other stuff. And so it's not a very spontaneous experience. These are carefully planned, choreographed missions. So who do you call to build an impossible plane? The usual suspects. The job went to a secret group inside Lockheed, a place called the Advanced Development Projects Unit. But everyone knew them by their nickname. Skunk Works. And they were led by a man named Kelly Johnson, a certified genius who didn't just design planes. He blew up the rule book on how to build them. Okay, Kelly, the first question is, shortly after you built the U-2, you knew eventually it was going to be <laughs> shot down. And that was the seed that uh, created uh, you yeah. starting to think about okay, the SR-71. We knew that... <laughs> In overflying Russia for four years, that they were making important advances in radar and missiles. And so in 1958, two years before Gary Powers was shot down, we decided we'd try to make a follow-on airplane, which became finally the SR-71, to fly higher and four times as fast. In the spring of 1958, Skunk Works starts work on Project Archangel the CIA's top secret plan to replace the vulnerable U-2 spy plane. Kelly had said, it's considered a successful flight if we just take off, leave the landing gear down, fly around and come back in and land. But then he says to me, how do you feel about uh, going supersonic on the first flight? So I said, I, I have great confidence in our escape system here, so uh, it's OK with me. Kelly ran the place with a few simple, powerful rules. His main one, he was in charge, period. No endless committees, no bureaucratic meddling. Another one, keep the paperwork to a minimum. Don't write about the work, just do the work. This whole philosophy, this obsession with speed and simplicity, it allowed his small team to do the impossible and do it fast. As soon as they started, reality hit them right away. Their first big problem, the air itself. At Mach 3, the air becomes the enemy. Friction heats the plane's skin to over 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Aluminum would melt, steel was too heavy. They needed something new. The answer was titanium. 93% of the Blackbird was made from this incredible metal, which was almost unheard of back then. But here's the best part of the story. Back then, the biggest supplier of high-grade titanium was the Soviet Union the very country they wanted to spy on. So the CIA had to get creative. They set up fake companies, used third-party brokers, and secretly bought the metal right from their adversary. We had to find out what the Soviet Union was doing, particularly with a missile program. 
We had a vital need to understand the capabilities of the Soviet military machine, but the Soviet Union was so vast that we could not gain this uh, by using conventional aircraft. To build the spy plane that would fly right over their heads. You just can't make this stuff up. And that titanium body led to one of the Blackbird's strangest features. See, that metal had to expand in the intense heat of flight. A lot. So on the ground, the plane leaked. It had to. The fuel tanks and fuselage panels were designed to fit loosely. Just picture it. The most advanced aircraft in the world, sitting on the tarmac, dripping fuel everywhere. It had to be imperfect on the ground to be perfect in the sky. One of the puzzles of extreme heat was never really solved. Sealants for the fuel tanks, they never came up with a polymer that would seal the joints in the skin panels that hold the fuel in. So the blackbirds sit on the ground and weep. That seems silly. You can look, oh, these stupid guys back in the 60s didn't know what they were doing. There's still no plastic, you know, that can get to 700 F and not turn into a burnt hot dog oxide. That bizarre leaky frame, it was just the vessel. The real magic, the source of all that power, was the heart of the beast. The Pratt & Whitney J58 engines. And these weren't just engines. They were monsters, hybrids. They called it a turbo ramjet. Here's what that means. At low speeds, they worked like a normal jet, getting the plane off the ground and up to speed. But as the plane got faster and the air got thinner, giant tubes inside would open up and the engine would literally transform itself mid-flight. It would start to operate like a ramjet, the kind of brutal, simple air-breathing engine a missile uses. But taming that power was a brutal, dangerous challenge. The pilots had to deal with something called an unstart. Imagine you're flying at three times the speed of sound, and with no warning, one engine just flames out. The plane would snap violently to one side. Pilots said it was like being in a car crash, slamming their helmet into the canopy. It took superhuman skill just to survive it, let alone get the engine running again. This wasn't just flying. It was wrestling a monster at the edge of space. And an engine like that needs special fuel, which leads to another weird paradox. The JP-7 fuel was so stable, so safe, you could drop a lit match into a bucket of it, and the match would just go out. So how do you light something that doesn't want to burn? With a chemical explosion, a shot of triethyl borane would ignite on contact with air, creating that iconic green flash. We never knew we had the most dangerous aircraft in the Air Force. It just, that's the way it landed, and that's the way you're going to do it. Of course, um, the first uh, time or two, uh, we did keep the pogos on. And, uh, and then when you, that got you started, you know, to feel comfortable with the plane and figure out what side might be a little heavier than the other and, and so forth so that you could transfer fuel accordingly to keep it as level as possible all the time. So you have these monstrous engines and this impossible to burn fuel, creating a bubble of pure energy. But on the Blackbird, every single part had to solve more than one problem at once. The engineering was holistic. It had to be. And that thinking extended all the way to the plane's skin, to the very thing that gave the Blackbird its name the paint. Because that iconic black color, it wasn't just for looks. It was a high-tech tool. It was a special paint mixed with tiny iron spheres, and it did two critical jobs. First, it was one of the best materials for radiating all that intense heat away from the plane's body. And second, it soaked up radar energy, making it one of the very first and most effective examples of stealth technology. And this obsession with heat, it went everywhere right down to the glass. See, normal glass would shatter instantly with the insane temperature difference. So the cockpit canopy wasn't glass at all. It was solid quartz. And to bond it to the titanium frame, they fused them together with sound waves. The engineers said, we've built this impossible machine. Who could possibly fly it? Flying this high was basically like flying a spaceship. A tiny leak in the cabin would be fatal in seconds. 
So the pilots wore the same kind of full pressure suits as astronauts. So the pilots had to wear the same kind of full pressure suits as astronauts, completely sealed away from the world. And because of that, every single mission demanded a strict ritual on the ground. First, the meal. It had to be low residue. Most of the time, steak and eggs. Then, the air. For one full hour before flight, they would breathe nothing but pure oxygen. This wasn't just a checklist. It was a rite of passage. So, you have the philosophy. You have the impossible tech. What does that actually get you? It gets you to 85,069 feet, over 16 miles up. The sustained altitude record. Up there, the sky above you isn't blue anymore. It's a deep, dark indigo. And the horizon below, you can see it curve. The actual curvature of the Earth. But SR-71 wasn't built for sightseeing. It was built to be untouchable. And here's the proof. In its entire history, over 4,000 missiles were fired at the SR-71. Not one ever hit. Not one. Their escape plan? It wasn't complicated. Just push the throttle forward and outrun it. But no statistic really tells the story. For that, you need to hear about the sled check. A Blackbird pilot, Brian Shule, was flying over the U.S., sharing the radio with other planes. Some Navy F-18 pilot gets on, all cocky, asking for a speed check. Air traffic control confirms his impressive speed. A little Cessna pilot asks for his speed. About 90 knots, says the controller. The F-18, loving the attention, asks again. Then, from the edge of space, Brian Shule keys his mic. His voice is calm, quiet. He says, Center Aspen 20, can I get a ground speed check? The entire radio frequency goes dead silent. You can just imagine all these pilots leaning forward, listening. Finally, the controller comes back on and you can hear the strain in his voice. Aspen 20, I show you at 1,980 knots, over 2,200 miles per hour. The boasting stopped. The Blackbird had spoken. LA Center, Aspen 30, have you got a ground speed readout for us? You could almost hear a collective gasp on Freak, like, oh, the poor fools didn't hear the previous transmissions. Oh, they, they got crushed like a grape. It's, it's just a pilot thing. But Center had to give you that same voice. Aspen 30, we show you 1,992 knots. <laughs> Cross the ground. When I knew I was going to like Walter a lot is when he came back and said, Center, we're showing a little closer to 2,000. And when the time finally came for the Blackbird to retire, it didn't go quietly. On March 6, 1990, the plane was scheduled for its final flight from L.A. to D.C., where it would be delivered to the Smithsonian Museum. The pilots decided to give it a proper send-off. They crossed the entire United States in 64 minutes, a victory lap, a final defiant reminder of what it could do before it became history. Dream assignment was this SR-71, which I got to fly after the uh, Phantom. So I got to fly the airplane for six years. It just happened that when the airplane was retired in the early 1990s, all the museums wanted one for display. And the Smithsonian Institution said, we want a Blackbird for display. And they wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Air Force. When your pilot brings the airplane to the Smithsonian, please have him set in an official coast-to-coast -coast speed record, and that will call the public attention to what a great, great airplane it's been for our country for 25 years. So I was actually ordered to set a speed record. <laughs> so. so if this plane was so incredible, why is it in a museum? The truth is, the operational costs were astronomical. And in the 90s, spy satellites seemed like a cheaper, easier solution. But there's a problem. Satellites are predictable. You know where they're going to be. They can't react to a sudden crisis on the ground. They leave a gap. And that gap, that's where the story comes full circle. Because that same group, Skunk Works, has been busy building the SR-72, the son of Blackbird. It's uncrewed, it's hypersonic, and it's designed not just to spy, but to strike. The legacy is evolving. Subscribe to Helios for more insights into the machines that define our future.